this this is Tradescantia fluminensis. Uh, this is the way it grows. It comes up, it likes a shady location and it will grow to a, about that high and it will form very dense thickets. And the problem with it is that it suppresses the native uh, flora, particularly the, the thing that we value in these sort of situations, which is uh, small ferns and ground covers. So that's what it looks like. Um, so we've got a, a program underway to try and deal with the problem of trad. We tried for many years to eradicate trad uh, as volunteers and as agencies by either pulling it out manually, which you can see is, is very easy, but the problem is that pulling it out manually, if you leave one of these little segments, the, the stem is formed by segments, and if you leave behind one of these little segments, that will grow back into a forest of Tradescandia like that. So that means that to get rid of trad effectively, you have to remove every last little piece of Tradescandia, which proves in the real world to be just about impossible. Either doing it manually or by using a, a raking technique, which we'll demonstrate later, or by using herbicide. The herbicide is probably the most effective, but it needs to be repeated several times. And that's obviously not good once you've got, once you've cleared this area and you've got native flora regenerating, the last thing you want to do is come back and spray it and <laughs> kill all your regeneration. Hi, my name's Kim Saunders. I'm the Urban Fringe Weed Management Initiative Officer for um, the Dandenong Rangers Project. Um, I've been working with the Community Weeds Alliance of the Dandenongs for a while now and this the progression of this project uh, for the Wandering Trad has been really exciting. I think the work that's been done here um, will have a legacy well into the future, especially assuming that the biological control comes off. Um, wandering Trad is such a problem for all of us as agencies to, to control and maintain and I think um, I think biological controls definitely going to meet your major help. And in the shorter term, the, the um, on-ground works that will come up as a result of this funding should be, I think, really beneficial on a local level and give us a lot of opportunity to engage with private landholders, which I'm really interested in. And, and the Urban Fringe Program and this trade program, I think, will work really closely together. And I think it's exciting times for the Dendron Rangers. My name is Jenny Solwick. I'm the secretary of CWAD, the Community Weed Alliance of the Daniels. And uh, I am very supportive of the TRAD project, the biological control of TRAD. And I, at first I was a bit concerned that maybe um, they would have to be very, very careful that they introduced, when they introduced it because um, of all the problems that we've had with species control in Australia in the past, like the cane toad, etc. So uh, when Bill has explained to me, Bill and Cole, who's the person who's very involved with this pro the biological control, um, when he explained to me about what they're doing in New Zealand and how careful they are with the beetles and the fungus, etc., then I thought that that would be a wonderful thing. And uh, so at the moment, they're just doing mitigation, as he said. And the biological control won't happen for three or four years. That's 
as I gather. Uh, my name's Anne Elizabeth. Um, I started off an, on this environmental adventure joining a local friends group. There was a creek opposite my house and the residents in the street started a, a friends group so we'd go in and pull out the weeds. And from that small group I started joining the local land care group and now I'm also a member of the weed, Community Weed Land Alliance of the Dandenongs which to me encapsulates the whole problem of the Dandenongs which I really want to protect because I love living here. Um, the issue with trade is that when, as a group, we apply for a grant, for a Melbourne Water Grant or a community grant, a lot of the money goes, uh, at least I think it's about two thirds of the amount of money, has to go on chemicals to spray trad. And if we could take that component, if we could take the trad out of the, um, um, if we had to, could spend less money on trad, we could spend more money on habitat rehabilitation and controlling the other weeds. Okay, uh, we're going to do some work in the forest, so one of the first considerations is to do that safely. So we need some protective equipment, and when we get into the forest, we'll have to make sure that we're working in a safe situation. So first of all, the, the, the risks we're likely to face in the forest, uh, uh, things that, that bite, uh, the most likely thing is, is going to be leeches. If you know that you're sensitive to being bitten by things like ants and leeches, uh, it's a good idea to make sure that you are protected. Um, the ways you can do that are to uh, tuck your socks in. And that means that the, the leeches will, will crawl onto your boots, up your trousers, and up to here. Now, if you have if you have your shirt out, the leeches will crawl up underneath your shirt into whatever's underneath there. So, tuck your shirt in, and the leeches will keep crawling up here until they get to your neck. You can use repellents. Uh, some people believe they're effective. If you don't like taking, pulling leeches off yourself, you just dust them with salt and they'll fall off. It's particularly important to keep leeches out of your eye. So to do that, if you think you've got a leech in your eye, ask someone else whether you've got a leech. And to get a leech from your eye, you need a pair of plastic tweezers. I have used a pair of pliers. The tweezers are better. You also need to carry with you a, a first aid kit in case something else happens. Uh, you also need to wear a good pair of protective gloves because there's lots of things in the, in the story that you can get cuts and abrasions from. So these are important. Uh, I, I prefer to wear gaiters. The gaiters deal with leeches and ants and all that sort of thing very effectively because they, they, they'll go straight up to where we can catch them again. Uh, so that's basically it. We're, we're ready to go to the forest now and do something useful. Before I start work in the forest, I need to make sure that I've, I'm working in a safe place. So before I actually start work, I'll have a look, look at the ground and see whether there's, there's lots of things I can trip over. If there are lots of obstacles on the ground, I'll just say to myself, you have to be very careful in there, Bill. And the other thing I need to do is, is have a look up and see whether there's anything up there that's going to fall on me while I'm busy working in here. And I can't see anything. There's a, an 80 metre mountain ash up there, but I don't see any dead limbs on it. So. I think it's safe for me to go ahead. OK, 
okay, the, the technique in, in raking Travis Gandia is simply this. We're using the rake, so just pick up as much as we possibly can and expose the bare soil. Now the problem with doing it this way is that in amongst the trad there will be native plants that are struggling but still surviving. So this is a shade nettle, that's a native plant and it's not a sting, it's a nettle that doesn't sting, so it's a nice one to have. And here there's a prickly currant bush which is also struggling and there will be other things here too. Now uh, there's, there's very little we can do when we're raking to save those sort of plants because, as you can see, there's, uh, this one here, that's a prickly current bush seedling, so that survived the raking. So that's, that's pretty straightforward and fairly easy to do, but you can see there's still plenty of trad left here, so it's very difficult to get rid of the whole lot. You can just, you can keep raking, there's an ivy you don't want, but this is effectively what we want because in the, the mitigation phase of the trap project we don't want to completely eliminate the weed. We're, we're prepared to tolerate some of it being left. The other consideration is we're obviously going to finish up with a lot of thread in a big heap. Uh, it's a good idea to, to put that on plastic or to cover it with plastic so that it can't spread from the heap. Uh, the other way it can be dealt with is to spray the heap so that it's killed. Okay, we're going to demonstrate the technique for manual removal of trad in, in this little area here. And while we're doing that, we'll probably find some native species which are still here but struggling so we'll try and save them and that's one of the benefits of, of doing a manual control method you can make sure that the existing native stuff does survive this area which might be maybe a square meter has taken me about 10 minutes uh, I've managed to save some native plants, a couple of prickly current bushes and a white elderberry. So that's one of the, the, the benefits of manual, that you can take more account of uh, and save what's here already. But it does take a long time and this, this will regenerate back to trad fairly quickly, even though I've spent a fair bit of time trying to find all the bits and pieces. You never, you never get rid of all of it. It's interesting to note this is, this is Tradescandia and it does flower in Australia but it doesn't produce fertile seed. And that's, that's a really big advantage to us because it means we don't have to worry about the seed being dispersed. Uh, and starting a new uh, infestation. Uh, so what we do have to worry about are the, the normal ways of spreading Tradescandia, which is by someone picking it up from their garden and bringing it to our forest and, and throwing it into the forest. And that 
that will grow into a new infestation of Tradescantia. The other way that trad can be spread is that if this plant is growing on the edge of a creek and it's tipping into the water like that, the end, as you can see, will easily break off uh, and float away down the stream. And it will lodge on the, the bank of the stream, uh, could be kilometres downstream and start a new infestation that way. The other way we believe is that animals who, who come through here, wallabies, wombats, uh, some of this material gets caught in their paws and again lands on the ground and can start a new infestation. So those are the ways in which Tradescanty gets spread around in our, uh, in our forest and in our gardens too for that matter. We need to take account of those things when we're, we're planning how to deal with trade.